Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be um, bold and uh, talk about two topics tonight, neither one of which is amateur radio. So how about that for living on the edge? Um, my main topic is going to be uh, radio and the Internet of Things. It's a topic that uh, I find really interesting. There's some cool stuff going on uh, at the nexus of computing and communications and chip design, and they're just, it's, it's just very cool. And it's not ham radio, but it is radio, and, uh, and I think there's some fun to be had here. The other thing I wanted to talk about tonight is what's called the Internet of Things. How many people have heard of the Internet of Things? Okay. And those of you who haven't heard about it, uh, you have any smart light bulbs, smart light switches? You have uh, a Nest thermostat hanging on your wall? Um, any, any of that kind of stuff? Uh, one of those cool doorbells that, uh, with a video camera in it and that tells you when somebody is trying to steal a package off your front porch? That's all the Internet of Things. A smart refrigerator that will tell you when you need milk. Um, Internet of Things. The, the basic idea of the Internet of Things is anything that consumes electricity, that, that sort of end game vision, anything that consumes electricity will have a computer in it, it'll be connected, so it'll have an Internet address, and it will be uploading data about what it's up to. A lot of these things are likely to be sensors, uh, probably the major component of the Internet, thing, uh, Internet of Things is, is envisioned to be sensors. So, um, and, and there's ample room for paranoia here. I'll let you do that on your own time. I'm not going to talk about that tonight. I'm going to talk about the technology, which is pretty cool. But, um, you know, the, uh, your house. So if all of the light switches have a little computer in them and have the ability to communicate, they could all also have other things in them. They could have temperature sensors, for example. And, uh, and those temperature sensors could be feeding temperature and humidity data, perhaps uh, infrared sensors feeding data about occupancy of the rooms in your house. Are you in the living room right now? Well, if you're not in the living room right now, maybe you don't need to air condition the living room right now. Maybe you can turn up the air conditioning in the living room when somebody goes in the living room. So uh, there's a lot of that sort of uh, home automation kinds of stuff that's being thought about. Uh, farmers have actually been using what we would now call the Internet of Things for a long time. There, there are, I remember 20 years ago, people were talking about putting multiple temperature, humidity, soil moisture, a uh, whole bunch of different sensors uh, in fields and using that to make very, very detailed decisions about application of fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, based on the actual conditions, not based on average conditions for the state. You know, the Extension Service says we should all fertilize this week. Well, that, that may be right for some people and not right for others. And, uh, and doing that sort of thing can save a lot of money. It can improve crop yields. Uh, it, can be, it can reduce the use of pesticides and herbicides uh, that can later get into the environment and do things that we don't want them to do. So uh, just tons of stuff. There are people who are talking about taking advantage of these already connected devices that we all walk around with that already have a bunch of sensors in them. You know, they've got, they know where they are. Uh, it's not my shirt, it's my phone I'm pointing at. Um, <clears throat> they know where they are. Uh, most of our phones these days have accelerometers in them. Uh, they, most of them have an altimeter in them, so they know what the air pressure is already. Uh, most of them have some sort of compass in them, so they have some information about magnetic fields and and uh, those sorts of things. Uh, you could easily imagine putting other stuff in them. You could put temperature sensors in them. You could put, um, um, I don't know, use your imagination. But you could, you could really, really cheaply load phones up with sensors. And uh, you know, one of the things that the National Weather Service always complains about is not having enough data about what the on the ground conditions are. Well, what if everybody walking around with a cell phone was sending temperature, humidity, 
air pressure to the National Weather Service all the time. That would be an incredible resource for forecasting the weather. Real detailed live information about weather conditions uh, on a very, very fine-grained basis. This is all the Internet of Things. And uh, there are lots of advantages. As we can see with lots of discussions about technology these days, there are some real disadvantages too. So there are lots of privacy issues, lots of security issues. People are working on those. I doubt that they're going to have the answers. As with most technology, the deployment will precede the answers to the privacy and security questions. And we'll have to have a lot of pain before, um, before we get where we'd like to be. Uh, you know, connected security cameras. Um, we've all, there are, there are internet connected security cameras, millions of them all over the world. And, uh, and most of them had virtually no security when they left the factory. And surprise, surprise, the hackers hacked into them and turned them into botnets and used them to attack and launch denial of service attacks against big companies, security cameras. Same thing's gonna happen here, I guarantee it. But let's talk about radio because there is no Internet of Things without radio. Most of these devices are not going to have any wires connected to them. They will either run on batteries that um, uh, will be good for a few years is the target for, depending on what the device is, anywhere from four to ten years is the current target. Or they will uh, use solar energy or there's a lot of work going on uh, to power these devices by, harness, uh, by harvesting RF energy. Um, and, and I just imagine the day when the local TV station demands to be paid for the, for the five kilowatts of RF energy that is, that, that's being parasited off their transmission to power all these devices. Somebody's going somebody's gonna to say, hey, who's going to pay us for that? Uh, but, but there's some really good work being done to power these devices just by harvesting energy from radio transmissions. So um, these things aren't going to be connected <coughs> to anything. They're going to be standalone and wireless. Um, so there are some standards, uh, and, and this, is, this is where I, I do my disclaimer. I am not an expert on this stuff. I'm really interested in it. I think there's a lot of cool stuff here. It's not a ham, ham radio, but it is radio. And, um, and I'll talk in a little bit uh, uh, about how easy it is to start tinkering with this stuff. Uh, so I'm, I'm really interested. I want to tinker with it. Not an expert. Um, uh, there are some standards involved here. The, the primary uh, radio technology that is currently being planned for the Internet of Things is something called LORA. L-O-R-A. It's an acronym, really clever acronym. It stands for long range. You'd think they could have done better. So LoRa is the physical layer. For those of you who are into network stacks, uh, did any computers or networking, this is the physical layer. This is the moving bits from one place to another. Uh, and um, I'll do some show and tell in a few minutes here. So uh, LoRa is, uh, it talks about uh, it, it drives, one of the interesting things about the Internet of Things is that it's driving a lot of technological innovation around power consumption, communications protocols, uh, security. Uh, as one great example, the, um, the main processor in our CubeSat uh, is, is, was very, very memory constrained. And we needed to have uh, a digital signature algorithm so we could verify commands coming from the ground station really came from our ground station. So the spacecraft could, could run, a, run a reverse digital signature and make sure that, yep, that command packet telling me to blow myself up really came from, a, from the UVA ground station, not from somebody with a, an arrow in the parking lot who, who has a grudge. Um, our, our satellite is very memory constrained. If I use one of the standard uh, digital signature protocols, uh, like AES, for example, uh, very, very strong cryptography uh, based on hash tables, big tables of numbers generated from prime numbers, the hash table alone for that digital signature would have taken up 
two-thirds of the memory available on our spacecraft. This is a non-starter. National Inter In Institutes of Standards and Technology has, for a number of years, had a competition for cryptographic routines for the Internet of, Internet of Things. They're all designed to run on very low power processors, not very fast, and not much memory. And so I used a cryptographic algorithm designed for your light switch that's running on our spacecraft because it, it only uses about 60 bytes of RAM instead of five kilobytes. So uh, uh, lots of work on really, really low power um, computing. These things have to be able to run on batteries for years. So all sorts of new processors and things called systems on a chip. So basically a complete computer on a chip uh, that just sip electrons very, very slowly and have uh, really aggressive uh, power down modes. A lot of these devices are going to sleep most of the time. That's how they'll stretch the batteries. They'll sleep most of the time. They'll wake up once a minute. They'll do their thing, and then they'll go back to sleep. And so lots of, uh, lots of work on low power modes, sleep modes, saving uh, processor state so you don't have to have a storage device, a lot of that kind of stuff. And interesting stuff going on with radio as well. Uh, so LoRa is spread, spread spectrum, which means it distributes the information that it's transmitting across a broad uh, range of frequencies, um, pretty typically uh, uh, measured in tens or hundreds of kilohertz for LoRa. Uh, it is what's called a chirp protocol. And a chirp is that. With time, the frequency changes. So a chirp is whoop, that's a chirp. Except it happens a whole lot faster and a whole lot more of them per second. And we've got, this is of course slowed down with audio added for effect, but this gives you the. So this is kind of what LoRa is going to look like on the waterfall. And the way that information is transmitted is by shifting the chirp back and forth. So uh, a, a zero or a one is going to be sent by shifting, doing what's called a cyclic shift. So basically push that chirp over, and whatever falls off the edge comes back on the other edge. So it's a, it's a cyclic shift. And that uh, is how you send zeros and ones using chirps. And uh, it's spread spectrum because it's covering a fairly fairly big chunk of spectrum here. Um, let me go from 95 to 1. So that's about. Uh, it's about 10 kilohertz there. Yeah, this is a little one, about 10 kilohertz. So uh, because of that, uh, a noise spike that pops up um, in the middle of the spectrum is much less likely to disrupt the entire communication. That's the whole idea of spread, spread spectrum from a uh, reliability standpoint, is to minimize the impact of noise which uh, allows you to deal with uh, a lot more environmental noise, which allows you to run at lower power, which allows your, bat your batteries to run longer. Uh, the military also loves spe spread spectrum because it's very hard to eavesdrop on. They used a different technology, which is called frequency hopping. Yeah, heard that already. Okay. Then um, on top of this, so that's the... That's the, uh, the physical layer. That's the how do you get bits from one place to another. In order to actually be useful, you have to have things further up the network stack. I should have done this the other way. No talk about network is, uh, networks is complete without a slide on the OSI model. So uh, physical layer, this is low rod down here. This part right here, which is about getting usable bundles of information from one place to another, uh, what, what you would call packets in packet radio. Uh, is something called LoRa WAN, or Wide Area Network, and um, and LoRa WAN relies on some infrastructure like we use repeaters. Uh, there are the equivalent of repeaters for LoRa WAN. LoRa WAN. It's very difficult to say. Um, and uh, and the range they they like to talk about range of LoRa um, up to 10 kilometers. Nobody really buys that. It's really more like three or four probably in a city, maybe if you're out in the country and, and the antennas are up high with line of sight. 
uh, you're going to get 10 kilometers, or probably even further. But uh, in a real environment, in a city environment, um, probably a few kilometers. <coughs> but lower land is a mesh network. So if you can get your packet to another node that can get to a gateway, which has an internet connection, which can get to the server that's collecting the data, then that's okay. You just take two hops to get there. So, uh, and, the, and the, the nodes are designed to connect to each other dynamically when nodes come and go. And we're talking about, you know, in a city, in a city the size of Charlottesville, in, eventually we're talking about probably millions of these devices in the Charlottesville area. Uh, none of them is going to have a hard time finding another one to take the next hop and hand the traffic off. Uh, this is not a high bandwidth network. This isn't streaming video. Uh, this is data rates anywhere from a few hundred bits per second up to theoretical maximum of about 50 kilobits per second. So this is uh, probably the typical connection is going to be, for those of you who remember, dial-up speeds. You know, when we were happy to have, uh, have our 2400 baud modem. Uh, that's probably going to be typical. But you're talking about devices that are mostly uploading data. They're doing it relatively infrequently. Um, and, uh, and, and so they don't need a ton of bandwidth. You know, this isn't going to replace your, your internet connection at home. Uh, so uh, people and corporations are very actively deploying these gateways all over the world. This is in uh, Kiel, an outdoor gateway, good location, so uh, covering a sizable fraction of the city. And a city, a big city like that, would probably have a number of these gateways scattered around the city. Each of these gateways, because we're talking about relatively low data rates and intermittent connectivity, each of these gateways can handle many thousands of uh, devices connected to it. Um, I've got one here that's a development gateway that can handle a few hundred devices, and, and, it's, and it costs 35 bucks. Uh, a big one that can handle lots, maybe five or six hundred dollars. So these are uh, pretty cheap, easy to deploy. Um, really? I thought I had one more slide. Um, there are a few, uh, I can see a few public gateways deployed around Charlottesville. It looks like they're mostly uh, for development purposes. They're indoors. Uh, I don't think anybody's put one up high. So um, this stuff all runs in the unlicensed um, bands, uh, for the 400 megahertz and 900 megahertz unlicensed spectrum. And sorry about that, John. Quacking the microphone there. So uh, just to give you an idea of what some of these things look like, uh, this is, anybody wants to come up and take a look at these afterwards, this is your basic low raw radio. radio. Um, it's, uh, it's the radio itself, the circuit board for the radio is about the size of a postage stamp. Um, it has uh, this, this little uh, breakout board. The breakout board has got uh, pins on the back, standard spacing for a proto board, so you can put it in a, on a proto board and hook your Raspberry Pi or your Arduino or whatever controller you're going to use up to it to, to uh, do uh, hardware and software development. Uh, this this uh, transmits, this one uh, is about 100 milliwatts, I think. So yeah, they're very low power. Um, and uh, but uh, this radio, I think, costs uh, 25 bucks. Uh, I've got a gateway. Yeah, this is uh, a development gateway. So this is suitable for connecting, oh, 50 or 100 devices. It's got a uh, radio on one side, and on the other side, uh, one of these um, uh, fairly decent performance, uh, very low power consumption system on a chip uh, that you can use to, to control it and run your gateway software. Uh, 
So this is a, a gateway suitable for, for doing tinkering and development. This was, I think, $45. Uh, if you're a Python programmer, this is, uh, it's got a radio and a, uh, a system on a chip with a native Python uh, interpreter on it. So you can write all your code in Python if you love Python. Uh, it's, it's just really cool stuff and, um, and cheap, uh, cheap to play with. Uh, there's, a, there's a really healthy uh, supply of uh, development boards and development tools. Uh, like, like most of these things, there are people who are trying to get rich out of it. So uh, the cell companies, for example, so LoRa is one communications technology that is, uh, is a major player. But there's also uh, a technology that's based on LTE. And most of the major cell carriers uh, have rolled out uh, that LTE for the Internet of Things uh, and will uh, sell you uh, access anywhere they've got their cell towers. You can get at you, your devices if you've got uh, that kind of radio in it instead of a low radio. Uh, you can get a subscription from AT&T, and they will, for so many, you know, hundredths of a cent uh, per um, kilobyte, uh, will transport your traffic over their cellular network. Uh, there are companies that will sell you the infrastructure to take this data and actually do something with it. Uh, there is also open source code that people have written to run the infrastructure, the, the servers, and the gateway uh, software. Uh, there's there's a, a really robust open source software community that's grown up around the Internet of Things. So um, it's, it's something that if you're interested in tinkering with uh, a, a new radio technology, uh, it's pretty cheap to get started. And sooner or later, somebody is going to decide to make the investment and put up a public gateway in Charlottesville that we can connect our devices to. But uh, for now, uh, we could, for example, if anybody else is interested, we could get together once a month and bring our devices and set up a little network and play if anybody's interested. So that's what I know about the Internet of Things. John, you, you I, had, uh, I had a question back here. That 100 mil uh, device that you tell about, yeah. what would the range of that be? Well, so the, 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 uh, the LoRa Alliance, uh, which is a, a consortium of, of manufacturers who are making this stuff, claims up to 10 kilometers. Uh, that is wishful thinking. Most people, most people think it's more like two or three kilometers in an urban area. That's the front door of my house. Yeah. Uh, so, other question. Yeah. When you're talking about it being a mesh network, is the idea that, that um, two light switches could communicate between each other and then go to a gateway, or does yeah. it all go to the gateways? Right. 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 And uh, so this this is what's considered a, a, a wide area. LoRa is considered a wide area network. Uh, communications mechanism. Uh, the the Internet of Things also assumes that within your house, uh, you will be running what is referred to as a personal area network. And Bluetooth is the personal area network technology that almost everybody's heard of. Uh, there are some others that most people haven't heard of. There's one called Zigbee that, that you might, if you're interested in home automation, you've certainly heard of Zigbee. Uh, lots of these smart light switches and light bulbs and and thermostats are running Zigbee to talk to each other. And it's, it's sort of like Bluetooth, but uh, until very, very recently, Bluetooth has kind of been a power hog. And um, Bluetooth devices either ran through batteries pretty fast or, um, or had to be plugged in. And Zigbee was designed to be very economical uh, in terms of power. But now the latest Bluetooth standards, have, they've put a big emphasis. Uh, so now you have what's called Bluetooth LE for low energy. And uh, so Bluetooth is still a player in that space. So the stuff in your house is likely not going to be lower out. It's probably going to be Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave is another one. You'll see, I think you can go to 
go to um, Lowe's and buy light switches and light bulbs that get somewhere on the package you'll see Z-Wave. Well, that's another one of these personal area network technologies that's, that's good for 40 or 50 meters. A way to harvest data from the gateway, or would that be on the back end? Yeah, so uh, behind the gateway is there's, there's this whole uh, application infrastructure that, that harvests the, the data from the gateways, combines it together into databases, does data mining, uh, basically implements whatever your application is. Your application might be, um, oh, uh, uh, well, bus routes. Ah, let's take let's take one that's a little more modern. Um, scooters. I'm sure we've all seen all of these scooters abandoned by the side of the road. I'm still trying to get my mind around people riding a scooter and then just dropping it by the side of the road. <laughs> it still seems bizarre to me. Um, uh, I'd be willing to bet that, I, I don't know about the ones here in Charlottesville, but I'd be willing to bet that at least some of them are using LoRa to communicate between the scooters and their servers. So they know, you know, somebody goes around town during the night and picks up those scooters and recharges them and puts them in locations where they think people are going to want them tomorrow. Some human being does that right now. And, um, and somehow those scooters have to tell um, uh, Lime, is that one of them? Uh, all those Lime scooters have to have to phone home and, and say where they are so that people know where to pick them up. And, uh, and that's the Internet of Things. So that would be an application. There would be, uh, so they're, they're certainly running servers that pick up however those are communicating, probably cellular, uh, that, that pick up that location data and integrate it and turn it into a work list for each of their uh, employees who goes out and picks up scooters at night. So there's application infrastructure sitting behind this that's very, that's very domain specific. But those scooters could also be collecting environmental information. Uh, they, could be, uh, they could be giving information to, um, uh, to uh, VDOT about um, road usage. So they could be doing multiple things at the same time and have different consumers consuming different kinds of data. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would like to comment, while it's not ham radio, it is certainly amateur radio uh, in the, the broad sense of the term, and that yeah. it's, it's not a, a ham or an amateur license band, but it, it kind of, to me at least, fits in with the spirit of tinkering with radio and, and yeah. messing with like the, the technology, it's the same thing, just a different license class. I think uh, so, too. Spiritually, it's the same, I always say. Uh, that's um, the way, way I feel about it, too. Yeah. It and, and in fact, there is a little bit of overlap. The, the 400 megahertz um, uh, ISM, the unlicensed band, actually overlaps with our 400 megahertz allocation, our 70 yeah. centimeter allocation. Um, I say, with, with that in mind, I, I think that, you know, we always hear what are ways that we get more people involved in amateur radio, and especially we just talked about outreach with this club and stuff like that. Uh, I personally think that um, we have resources as a club that many individual people don't have. We have access to towers. We have access to people that know RF. We have access to people that know how to properly set up an antenna for a given frequency. Um, and, and we have access to the university uh, through the connection to the club. And I think setting up one of these gateways would be a fun project to consider for the club. Would be a fun project. Uh, Instead of a uh, public gateway, um, it's it's not like I said, it's not amateur radio according to the SEC, but it's it's a very much in spirit of, of the concept of amateur radio. I agree. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we are going to discuss a new member application. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, would the would the new member care to stand up? The new potential member care to stand up and uh, and tell them about themselves. Okay. I'm Dave. I'm a, a boomerang ham. I had my novice back in the mid 70s, which is a long time ago. A lot of things have changed, and I'm 